Hello, my name is Jacob, and I'm a Norse pagan. And today, I'm back in the forest of Kentucky to discuss these mischievous little creatures, or maybe even these beautiful tall creatures that give wisdom to people. And those creatures I'm talking about are the elves. So the reason I brought them up in this way is because do while doing this research for this video, I have found that there is so many different ways to envision elves. We see it across media today. We see elves represented as Santa's workers. We see elves represented in Harry Potter as these kind of ugly little goblin creatures that are indentured servants. And then of course we have Lord of the Rings where they're pictured as these beautiful advice givers. So where do they fit within the Norse mythos? What are elves to Scandinavian people in the past? and what are they to the mythology? All of these subjects we're going to be talking about today in this video about elves. One of the things I learned in Germany and my time abroad is that you have to respect the nature that's around you. Yes, Germany was beautiful. The Alps were beautiful. Switzerland was beautiful. Some of the most beautiful sights I've ever seen. But the thing that I, I really appreciated is even though I was in Munich, I was traveling an hour or two to go to the Alps to see these beautiful things. And it made me really reflect on how much of a kind of a natural rut I kind of got into. And I think a lot of people that hike a lot, that go outside a lot, and yes, people in this faith get into ruts of where they go. And so one thing that I really wanted to do coming back to the States is every time I go and film a video, I want to see somewhere else. I want to see somewhere beautiful in Kentucky, in the place I live in. And so yes, this place is an hour away, and it is near where I normally film, but I've never been on this trail. It's called Pilot Knob, and this is actually a small mountain. I don't know if it is actually technically a mountain. It's still a big hill that has a really nice overlook, supposedly, at the end. And um, so far, you know, like I've seen this beautiful spot right here with the red tree in the background, and of course the path being highlighted, and I was like, of course I gotta film here. So that is something I wanted to at least share in this video, because it's something that I'm reflecting on coming back to the States. Now, as far as elves, this is something, <laughs> to start this video, I really wanted to share the spectrum of elves that I kind of developed while doing this research because there are so many different ways to see elves that elves are represented in, especially in media. Now, of course, in writing as well, which is where it started, but elves really have taken on a nature of their own. They've developed further into their own mythology that is no longer just simply based in Norse mythos where it seems that elves kind of originated. Of course, there are elves within other mythologies, but elves within Norse mythology seem to be one of the oldest. So as far as the spectrum of what an elf is, on one end, you have these mischievous elves and then these advice-giving wise elves. And also tied with that spectrum is that the taller and more beautiful the elf is, the more wise they seem. And then as you go further down, the uglier they become. Um, you can't say you look at Dobby, you know, yes, yeah, so you can look at Dobby and be like, oh, he's kind of cute in a sad way, but Dobby is not a pretty elf from Lord of the Rings. And so really what I wanted to explore in this video and hopefully what I can share with you is my thoughts on where elves within Norse mythos really fit on this spectrum. Um, so I'm gonna head further up the trail here and I'm gonna share with you the historical information we have about elves within Norse mythos that we have in the prose and poetic edda. we have finally made it to the top of this small mountain and even though it is a small mountain I think the view is pretty incredible um, but man did I not miss Kentucky summers <laughs> it was quite the hot hike to get up here but it's definitely worth it um, so in talking about elves within the Norse mythos and the prose and poetic Edda there's not a lot and some of you might be wondering why I haven't mentioned the difference between light elves and dark elves and we'll get to that and kind of dive deeper into that subject as well because that kind of just comes from one line within the prose Edda so within the Poetic Edda, there actually isn't that much. Obviously you have Alfheim, which is the realm from which the elves are from within Norse mythos. Other than that, the only line we're given is that the gods gave Freyr the land of Alfheim long ago as a gift in his youth. And that's basically it. We get no other descriptors of Alfheim and what it is and what it looks like. Um, there's a little bit more in the Prose Edda, but I mean, again, the Prose Edda mostly got its information from the Poetic Edda on a lot of these mythos things that Snorri didn't add. 
the biggest section of elf knowledge we have within the Poetic Edda comes from Alvis Mall, where this is the story where Thor and Allwise get into a like wisdom spouting match, much very similar to how Odin does as well. And at one point they get into like a, a word challenge, so to speak, where a question is asked where it says, men call the earth earth. What do elves call this? What do the dwarves call it? What do the Aesir and the Vanir gods call it? And so we're given a pretty good section of what elves call things. I don't know how this helps you too much, but I wanted to at least share it. It is interesting. So just running through these, they begin in stanza 10 in Alvis Mall. So it starts here in stanza 10, and they're saying that humans call the earth what we stand on earth, and that elves call it grower. In stanza 12, they're talking about the sky, and it says that humans call it heaven, and the elves say it's high roof. And then stanza 14, they're talking about the moon and the fact that the elves say year counter. And then stanza 16, they're talking about the sun and that the fact that the elves call it beautiful wheel, which I kind of like. And then they're talking about clouds and elves say weather causer. And then we have wind and the elves call it noisy traveler. And then they're talking about the time of no wind and how humans call that calm. And then it says elves call it days sleep. Interesting again. And then they're talking about the sea, and humans call it ocean. Elves call it ore place, which is interesting. And then we have woods, forests, and of course humans call it woods or forest. And then elves say pretty leaves. And then we have the night, and elves call that good to sleep in. And then finally there is um, what humans call seeds, and they say it's called barley. And then elves call it things to make beer. Interesting. Um, and that's basically it in the Poetic Edda. So we're not given too much. There is a nice summary in the Crawford edition that I wrote down, and it was how Crawford summarized what the elves were, and I feel like this is a really good backbone to help you understand them. He wrote down, a supernatural creature associated with the gods, but appears of a lower rank. Elves are never described in terms that indicate what, if any, special appearances or characteristics they may have. They may be the same creatures as dwarves. And this mostly comes from the fact that there is a lot of information, or at least a lot more information, about dwarves within Norse mythology, and very little information on elves. I think there's also a linguistic connection. I'm not the best at linguistics, so I don't really think I can speak on that too much, but I do think there's a linguistic connection. Obviously, you have Alfheim being the world of elves, and then you have Svart Alfheim, which is, you know, I think that's dark elves, or the, you know, the earth elves. I don't really know where this connection directly comes from. I can't give you that answer, but it, there is a theory out there that there the same beings as far as dwarves and elves. And then we come to the prose Edda. We are given more of a description of what Alfheim looks like. Um, it's hard to say where Snorri got this information, but in my Everyman's Edda edition on page 19, there's a reference to Alfheim and a description of it. There's one place that is called Alfheim. There lives the folk called the Light Elves, but Dark Elves live down in the ground, and they are unlike them in appearance, and even more unlike them in nature. Light elves are fairer than the sun to look at, but dark elves are blacker than pitch. And this seems to be the core reason why there is a difference between light elves and dark elves, and then are dark elves just dwarves? Um, it's hard to say. And, you know, I think this is interesting because obviously fantasy has rolled with this. Um, predominantly the Elder Scrolls series, as far as video games, they have high elves, wood elves, dark elves. Um, and then, of course, the Dwimmer, which are basically just elves that lived in the earth. And they all look very similar to each other. So I think the fantasy games that we play and the fantasy novelizations um, that we like, including like Dungeons and Dragons, basically really a lot of fantasy series have this difference between light elves and dark elves. Even in Lord of the Rings, the orcs are really just demented elves. So they're kind of the dark elves of that universe, but they're not the dwarves. So there's many different ways you can go on this and I can't give you one right answer, um, but there's evidence for light elves, for dark elves, for dwarves, and people tend to toss those around as they will. And we've gotten a lot of different interpretations of that. The weirdest being to me in God of War, that video game, which I, I've done a, a video review of, and the Dark Elves in that game and the Light Elves in that game are really weird. Uh, but of course, that game also has the three different types. It has Dark Elves, Light Elves, and it has Dwarves as well, which are three distinct races. So again, it seems like people take this information and kind of jumble it up however they will. So that is the information that we have, historically at least, from the Prose and Poetic Edda. Now, this normally wouldn't be enough information really to do a video on. However, I did purchase a book, and this is, I think, the main meat and potatoes of this subject matter, and that comes from Icelandic stories about elves. Um, many of you may have heard these before, but they also call them the hidden people um, that live in Iceland alongside of everyone else, and there is 
many folk tales and stories about these elves. And I think this really is the most information we have about elves. And if you're going to look at the elves in a Nordic context, in a Norse mythology context, I think you can look at no better option than the Icelandic elven stories of the hidden people. Is this not an amazing view? Again, I miss Germany, but views like this are all over Kentucky and it is absolutely gorgeous. Again, very hot though. So the book I want to talk about, and the book I recently purchased to really be the backbone of this video is The Little Book of Hidden People. And this is by Alda Sigmund's daughter. And this is actually from a woman in Iceland. Now she's not a Norse pagan, at least from what I can tell. And she does have a pretty long section in the beginning where she talks about how most people don't believe these legends anymore, even though they were believed at some point. Um, it's really the book boils down to 20 stories about the hidden people within Icelandic folk tales. Much like the Prose Edda, these are kind of hard to get through in some regards because there is a lot of Christian influences. It does talk about how the hidden people or elves were descendants of Eve. And there are several different like Christian things that kind of go along with them, including the fact that the elves tend to target people who are not baptized, um, in particular babies who are not baptized. So it was kind of used as a Christian context to say, hey, ba baptize your children. Um, but really, this was a way to really signify the struggles of the Icelandic people living in such a harsh environment. And these stories gave them, you know, an entertaining story, but also were this like the, the, the spook in the dark, the scary thing in the dark that kept people um, from going out at night, mostly children from going out at night. Um, so they did have a practical purpose. I mean, we have these folk tales, even as Americans, um, every culture in the world has these folk tales. But just because there is a Christian influence and there's these folk tales, the fact that it's talking about elves, and I think the way that it describes them is a way that matches their description in the prose and poetic Edda. Um, so I do want to kind of summarize one of the stories at the very least so you get an idea of what these elves are like within Icelandic mythology. But before going into that, I did want to give like a brief rundown of how the Icelandic hidden people or elves are described as to give you a better image. Um, so they're described as beautiful and neatly ordained. They have beautiful clothing. They have beautiful homes. Um, they tend to keep to themselves and they're really mischievous. They're kind of compared to changelings, at least in this book, um, that they are really out to steal children, that they're there to lure men away, um, to, you know, use people. But there is some stories where there are actually good benefits to them. And again, it seems like a lot of the negative connotations come from Christian mythos, Christianity, trying to turn these elves into kind of the villain evil characters so maybe there isn't much truth to them in in the natural mythology because again there are some really good stories um, where the elves need help from humans or trade with humans um, and end up giving uh, the humans something really nice so according to the Icelandic mythos um, the hidden people could not give birth on their own that they required a human to assist in the birthing process and so a lot of these stories involve an elven man going out to find a woman that could help deliver a baby um, within their like hidden people home and then they were often given rewards and left well i mean i assume that if your if their spouse would, did not make it through the birthing process you were not treated right um, one thing that is interesting about these stories is the elves supposedly had a liquid that they would rub on the eyes of their newborn and a lot of these stories involved the the midwives so to speak rubbing this water in one of their eyes which allowed them to see the hidden people because that is one of the other aspects of them is they can't actually be seen unless they want to be seen which is really fascinating um, now they can be, choose to be seen or if they, someone has this liquid they can be seen as well and it also mentions that if someone is not baptized they can see them or or if someone is clairvoyant. So there's very different ways to see the hidden people. It, within the actual mythos, it seems that the hidden people live within rocks a lot of the time. They live in like rock outcroppings and things like that. You know, yes, they're kind of tied to the forest in a way, but there's not a lot of woods um, within Iceland. So they're not really tied to this mythos. Um, and it also, they come up a lot in the mist. If someone's walking around the mist, they come across a traveler who usually is one of these hidden people. One of the things I'm not able to do in this video is to tell you when things were added or changed. I simply don't have that information, but I can kind of infer and surmise that this information changed throughout history because there is so, many, so much history of this hidden people legend, and it went through probably a pagan era where there was a pagan era of storytelling, and then there was also the Christian era, which was the longest era, so again, there's a lot of Christian influences in these. But the one story I wanted to share with you, so essentially uh, there was a New Year's Eve party and everyone left to go to church to, to celebrate and to have a good time, and they would leave behind a maidservant at their house. 
And the first New Year's Eve, the maidservant was allured outside by um, hidden men, like the hidden people being men and the elves, um, and asked to dance. And so they had a great night dancing, and then they would be killed after the dance and used almost as a sacrifice. So there was a, a pagan element to this as well, even though there's Christianity to it. Um, people came home, saw that she died, and you know, blamed the hidden people. And so the next year, another maidservant was left behind. Same thing happened. Lured outside by the hidden people, danced, and then was killed. And then the third year, you had another maidservant left behind, but she knew the hidden people's tricks. And so uh, she was lured outside. She said, no, I'm not being lured outside by the hidden people. I'm not being lured by your dance and your, you know, your sexual nature, you elves. Because that's one of the things about them is they're very sexual beings within the Icelandic stories, always luring young men and women um, to try to have sex with them, which is... You know, I, again, it's it's interesting, but I think this is a very Christian element to try to, you know, stay away from a sexual temptation. Uh, but this woman did um, end up, you know, staying away from them all New Year's Eve, and she lived. And upon the elves leaving, they left her behind a gift that was not to be opened until her wedding day. And so this woman was eventually married and opened it up, and it was the most beautiful dress one, uh, one could imagine. And so the elves left her a gift for her, you know, purity and her chastity, so to speak. Again, this is probably a very heavy Christian influence story, but at the same time, I do think it shows that the elves have both a mischievous side and a reward-giving side. And of course, there's another story much later. I think there's actually a couple of stories about the midwife situation, how an elf needs help giving birth, and then afterwards gives a really nice gift to those that help them. There is a wide range of these elves, but where do they fit on this kind of spectrum? Uh, you know, are they these like kind of mischievous little goblin elves, or are these the, these beautiful Lord of the Rings-esque wise elves? And I think they fit pretty close to the Lord of the Rings side, and that's simply because Lord of the Rings was influenced by these Icelandic stories, by the Nordic interpretation of elves. And so this, this idea of them being beautiful, but also, you know, wise and, you know, kind of mischievous and keeping themselves, we see within Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit. This should tell you how hot it is out here because my camera just overheated and luckily I didn't lose any of that footage. Uh, but the last point I was trying to make before my camera almost melted is the fact that Lord of the Rings does kind of reference the fact that the elves can't be trusted. We don't see this as much in the movie adaptations, but within the book adaptations, J.R.R. Tolkien actually did include this, um, especially in Lord of the Rings. In Lord of the Rings, page 83 of The Fellowship of the Ring, in my edition, uh, when the hobbits meet the elves in the woods for the first time, it mentions specifically, go not to the elves for counsel, for they will say both no and yes. And this is something that you actually see within Elrond and the Council of Elrond there, is Elrond doesn't necessarily give them a yes or no answer. He kind of gives them this ambiguous, you know, this is what you should do, you know, wisdom <laughs> advice. And so I think that J.R. Tolkien saw this as well within the elves and his own research a hundred years ago, seeing that the elves were kind of mischievous, but yes, they were beautiful and yes, they were attractive and they did keep to themselves. So I think the Lord of the Rings example is a very close example to what the elves would have been like within Norse mythos. So let's see if this works. So I literally have the hat I wear sitting over the camera right now to keep it cool. I might have to keep tapping the screen to keep it alive. But the last part of this video, I really want to talk about um, elf lore today. As we've kind of referenced throughout this video, there are so many different ways to view the elves and so many different ways they're represented now. I mean, you have Santa's elves, which are off in their own kind of little world where they're small and yet helpful. Don't know where those came from. And then you have the small gremlin looking elves um, that we see in Harry Potter. And then over here, you have the small mischievous elves as well that are more like changeling based, stealing babies and things like that, which we see, of course, in the Icelandic as well. Um, and then, you know, the beautiful type, the beautiful elves, the Lord of the Rings as elves. Um, but really, you know, I think it's just important to understand the origin of these stories. So, you know, over the last few hundred years, you know, all these elf stories have come together to kind of form all these different viewpoints. And I think the most predominant is the Norse viewpoint and what came out of Lord of the Rings. And I think that's what influences the majority of elf media today and how elves are viewed. Um, so I hope I was able to explain that to you in today's video. But of course, 
where does this leave the faith today? If you're a practitioner, you know, can you give offerings to the elves? Can you connect with them? Um, and, you know, some people, it seems like the Icelandic people would tell you not to mess with the elves, you know, to kind of leave them alone, to go get baptized so they leave you alone. Um, so it's kind of hard to say, you know, what this means for everybody. Um, for me personally, doing this research, the hidden people is a concept. It's something that I've kind of come across in many people within the community. Some people call them fae, some people call them changelings or fairies. Um, there seems to be all kinds of different names for these mischievous kind of nice beings that live in the woods that you can't see. No matter what you call it, there is a mischievous force that seem to live in the woods and the rocks of the world um, that throw acorns at people, that steal things. I mean, there's house elves as well, house spirits. Um, so no matter what you call it, no matter what you call these little spirits, the hidden people, the elves, gremlins, whatever, there seems to be something that unifies us all in the belief of these ideas. And so I do think I choose to believe this as an idea that there are supernatural forces out there, like a supernatural being perhaps, that seem to mysteriously interact in our lives. Um, do I think that there are these big, beautiful, sexually provocative beings that walk around in the woods half naked trying to, you know, get pure young men and women to sleep with them? No, probably not. But with like most things, I believe there is an origin to these stories, and I think those origins are pagan. And I think our pagan ancestors did believe these beings existed. Um, do we have any evidence that they gave them offerings? Not really. I mean, maybe you can tell from the Icelandic stories that um, there was, you know, ways to appease them, perhaps. Um, but I can't really say. As with many things, the point of this video is to educate you on what I could find um, within my research about elves and mythology and within the faith. Um, you know, and you can take that as you will, and you can do whatever you want with your own practice. You can do nothing with it. But regardless, I hope you enjoyed this first hike back in Kentucky, and I hope you enjoyed these beautiful views I know I have have. I guess for the last, the very last thing for this video, I guess I could ask myself, am I going to do anything with the elves after doing this research? Because I've not really done anything with them before. And I think the only thing I can say is that I brought an apple with me. Oh, my hat. I guess the only thing I can say is that, oh my gosh, the flies. I guess the only thing I can say is that I brought an apple with me and I am going to leave it here as an offering for them to thank them for allowing me to do this video. And whatever comes of that, comes of that, you know. And that's, I think, how we explore the faith, as I've said in this, this channel many times before. Try it. See if it works. And, you know, at the very least, it, I'm thankful because I'm thankful for this channel, for this video, and for this beautiful day. My name is Jacob. I'm a Norse pagan back in beautiful Kentucky, USA. And thank you so much. Until the haul, skull.